what do you do if you flare too high right to sort of add information to to your mind so that if you do find yourself self beginning the process too high um what do you do if you just sort of began well first of all stop <laughs> you know if you realize that you're too high stop what you're doing and just wait until you're a little lower rather than going and then lifting your hands back up which causes a porpoise on the pitch axis and that's going to put you behind the power curve and literally behind the canopy right and now you've got to travel further to get in front of the canopy because parachutes don't flare when they're in front of you you know yeah. with with respect to the pitch axis right so pitch roll and yaw is heading change right so there's a lot more to talk about with that stuff but let's let's address first this piece and then we can evolve beyond um so when you start the process a little too high your job is to keep your wing level it's to not cause any kind of a surge where the canopy dives in front of you and the way i think of that aspect is to maintain line tension right so if i add breaks, I gain weight a little bit. If I lift my hands, I lose weight, right? So the canopy is moving forward on the pitch axis. So it's reducing the angle of attack, the angle of the wing to the relative wind, and it produces less lift. It's taking a smaller chunk out of the sky because you lifted your hands. And you can feel that when you do it. Whoa, you get kind of, as we say, light in the loafers. Um, so given that, um, you have to sort of pay attention to where the parachute is. And one of the most important drills that you can do up high is close your eyes after you've scanned for traffic and add and reduce brakes to sort of feel that heaviness and then redu reducing your weight. Heaviness and then reducing. Then when you lift up on your hands, as you feel this lightening of your load, immediately sharp down. So I lift up my hands relatively quick and then feel it move and then stop the canopy from surging. Aggressively pull it back behind you a little bit so that you're sort of recentering the pitch aspect of your flight so that you're, you can manage that pitch. And this, this method we we're talking about, like canopies going in front of you, add brakes, hands up when it goes behind you, right? To, to control where the parachute is, possibly upsetting that balance first and then doing the opposite of what the canopy is doing, that that whole thing will save you from a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. So when you flare too high, you're going to develop a pitch problem. And the deeper you get into that first flare, the more you're going to have a pitch problem that's going to be oscillating. And the Gs are going to increase and decrease. The amount of lift is going to increase and decrease. Right, The descent rate is going to reduce and then increase. <laughs> So you have to be really, really aware of what does what in terms of your pitch. So play around with just, you know, when you're up high, you can do it with your eyes open too, but to really tune into your sense of weight and try to manage it and, and deliberately upset that balance and then manage it. So just like in a stall recovery canopy wants to dive, well, you don't have to let it dive, right? You, you hit those brakes with a sharp little oomph not a big slow boo, right? If the canopy wants to dive, you can stop it. And then when it goes into its oscillatory cycle, some people call that a flight cycle, a pitch oscillation cycle is normal after you increase the lift of the parachute or you decrease the lift of the parachute by diving. There's still oh. going to be a change. Like right? So this is my glide ratio of the parachute. It's going to want to go above and below and above and below. That oscillation is something that you can address with the opponent input, the opposite input. So the canopy goes behind you, you reduce the drag, so it now wants to go forward. Canopy goes in front of you, you add drag to the parachute to reposition towards the center point. And if you consciously do that, let's say I hold the brakes and I make the canopy dive, I can go on, off, on, off, and I can make the parachute settle out much sooner with uh -huh. less, less altitude loss, that's a biggie. Because if you can manage your pitch after a premature flare, then you can be ready for that actual flare. You know, when the ground is actually about to hit you, you're in the middle at one G without roll axis problems, <laughs> without pitch axis problems, ready to give it that last little push, which is what you do when you flare a little bit high. 
So level two is that if you flare sharply, you know, at, at any point in the toggle stroke, you sharpen it enough to cause a full level off, right? Where you're actually not going down at all. If you do that, after about a second, maybe two seconds, the canopy will start to drift forward towards negativity. And I don't mean the world sucks, you know, I'm talking about reducing the angle of attack. Why? Because you slowed down because you flared, right? The action of flaring is work. You know, when I talk, I don't want to talk about regular work, you know, it's, it's mechanical change to the system, which increases the drag of the parachute, right? I'm presenting the bottom of the wing to the relative wind. It slows down. And when it slows down, you lose lift. And if you lose lift, now the canopy is going to sink, but also you're losing drag. So the canopy moves forward on the pitch axis, right? It wants to dive and it'll sink. So every flare is followed by a surge unless you add mechanical drag to the system by continually moving your hands down. Then you can progressively increase the angle of attack of the parachute and it will not do what I've termed a static surge, right? If you flare and stop, the canopy will do a static surge. But if you flare and then slowly continue moving those hands down, now you're replacing the drag that you lost because you flared <laughs> with a mechanical change to the parachute. You're increasing the amount of mechanical drag of the canopy, right? You're changing the shape of the wing and presenting more of the belly to the relative wind, a higher angle of attack, relative wind, wing, progressively increasing throughout the landing. Right, just like when you land an airplane, you level it off and then you keep nose up, nose up, nose up, nose up, nose up until it finally reaches its limit, which is the stall. Right. So that's your job in any given landing. But on, on one, when you flare too high, you, you kind of have to go, whoops, that was too high. So you stop immediately. And depending on how aggressively you gave the first input, you might immediately come up and then back down not up and stay up. So I overdo it. I go up and back down very quickly. You must rehearse this one. It's really, uh, so what you're trying to do is prevent this by doing this. This little bit of a, a hiccup is the lift and back down very quickly. And it'll keep you from climbing. So you stay down near the planet where you want to be. And then you progressively increase the brakes more and more and more and more and more so that you can you know, sort of keep the same amount of, of overall drag in a uh, gradually reducing airspeed environment, right? You need a higher angle of attack at a lower speed to have the same amount of drag to hold the pitch in this position, right? Otherwise the canopy is going to... And I know it sounds a little bit complicated, but it is what it is. Hello, I'm Brian Germain, and I would like to help you become a better and safer skydiver. There's a lot of information that needs to be assimilated, uh, and going to the drop zone is but one way to get that information. As a matter of fact, it may not be the best way, uh, depending on who's teaching you and how much time uh, they have uh, to dedicate to your training. You may or may not get all the information that you, that you need in order to get through the experience safely and get through uh, your ultimate graduation to become an A-licensed skydiver. And uh, so as a, a jumper of over, well, gosh, I don't know precisely how many jumps I've got, but it's over 15,000 and approximately 35 years of jumping out of planes, I've, I've put together uh, quite a bit of, of uh, understanding, not the whole story, but quite a bit of understanding on the topic. And I realized quite a few years ago that if I just sat down and just sort of wrote it all out, uh, starting with a book and then writing it out into seminar uh, PowerPoints and then traveling the world, teaching lots of classes, all literally all over the planet, uh, I realized that I could do a pretty good job of helping guide people through the, the course stuff uh, and, and get over some hurdles, possibly avoid some accidents. And so what I introduce to you today 
is something I created called Parachute Flight Safety. It's a video series um, that is eight hours long and we tack on uh, some extra materials uh, on top of the existing seven uh, different programs going from the very basic information about how parachutes fly, uh, structure and function kind of topics, all the way up through uh, more uh, advanced accuracy concepts and uh, navigational concepts uh, and the kind of stuff that you're really you're going to need to know and you'll get you'll get all this information or almost all of it if you hang in at the drop zone all the time for the next several months <laughs> but some of you haven't even gone to the drop zone yet and you're just sort of thinking about it and that's the perfect time to start right here at home uh, you can start down the, the uh, this very long path of becoming a skydiver by studying, by learning. Uh, and this has not been done before, uh, at least to my knowledge, you know, where now we've got tests and we've got uh, you know loads of, of videos that fit in with those tests. And you take the test and you go, oh, wow, I didn't get all those questions right. Fine. Gravity doesn't grade on a curve, so I need to know all of it. And there's a time code in each of these tests where you can go back and find out in the video, you know, not just specifically what the answer was, but what you really need to know to be able to get, uh, you know, kind of get that information deeply assimilated in your mind uh, because things happen fast up there and surprises do occur. Uh, you know, you know the, the experiences that I've had have blown my mind, you know, where I, I thought for sure I kind of had an understanding of it and then boom, there's something like, ah, I didn't think of that one. <laughs> didn't know that could happen. Uh, so that's why I do what I do. Uh, all these, you know, all these hours that I've spent talking to video cameras <laughs> and talking in live video conferences with folks all over the world, uh, individuals, groups, sometimes very large groups. Um, this, uh, this information seems to be really helping people. Uh, and, and some of you are going to be uh, enjoying this stuff as instructors. You're going to be learning from the material that I put together so that you can teach your students better. And I think that's great. That's, uh, that's one of my favorite aspects of teaching is, as I say, teach the teacher stuff. And I've done that in many, many countries where they gather together all the instructors from that country and I teach them how to, how to teach uh, parachute flight better because that's really the hard part and there's lots of folks that will teach you how to fly your body in free fall you just go to the wind tunnel and there are amazing people who can really refine your skills uh, in how to fly but once the parachutes open it gets complicated and so that's where a guy like me comes in all these years of designing and building parachutes and testing them, them out uh, many many hundreds of, of different prototypes that I've built and, and tested and, and learned from. And so you're going to get the benefit of that information and of the empirical analysis of data that have kind of uh, drawn some conclusions that are different, that are distinct from what is normally taught, closer to the truth of what's actually happening because uh, I prefer to attack all this stuff from the perspective of science. Of, of what is true, uh, gleaned through actual tests, numbers, experiments, instruments, uh, and separating separating out the confounding variables, so that we're not uh, dealing in opinions, <laughs> we're dealing in facts. So I hope that you you take a close uh, look at what we've got here in in the parachute flight safety video series on adventure wisdom. You can stream it, you can download it, uh, you can even uh, get. Uh, uh, a flash drive in the mail along with my book, which I think you'll find is very, very helpful as a, as a companion to this program. It's called uh, The Parachute and Its Pilot. People seem to really like it. Uh, on the fifth edition, I keep rewriting it and adding more material to it. Uh, as I continue to add more videos to the Adventure Wisdom uh, the library, that's going to help you become safer. Uh, I, I know that I, I can't help everybody avoid every hiccup in this sport. But with, uh, with enough effort on your part, I think you'll be able to, to get through this uh, in a way that is pretty smooth, that you're able to get over that initial hump uh, where you've got the information deficit uh, and you don't really know what to do in every scenario. But if you, if you fortify yourself with information, skydiving is very doable. It's a very reasonable thing to do and 
it is absolutely worth it. Best thing I've ever done. So join me, Parachute Flight Safety. I'll see you there. As long as you're having fun, well, do everything.